yes. Tuesday morning, five past ten. It's that time. David Whiting joins us in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Now, David, of course, will give you some free legal advice. One three hundred triple two seven seven four is the number, or you can text on oh four three seven 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 four seven seven four. And there are lines free, so take the opportunity to talk to David before we take calls, though. Um, I'm really hesitant to talk about this because I'm, I don't quite know where the legalities of it lie and not being a lawyer like you. But Lawyer X, what a fascinating story. Well, yeah, it's, got, it's still got a lot to run. I mean, it's been the front page of the Herald Sun every day since it broke. Um, and, you know, there'll be a whole lot of people. There's a, there was a suggestion on John's program last week by the Attorney General that there are three judges, three people who've been appointed to the bench who are uh, potential witnesses, and she was talking about excusing them from providing evidence. Uh, the Australian yesterday ran with a story um, that was a matter that went to the High Court in circumstances where a lawyer breached the solicitor-client privilege, and in that case there was a person who was a, a fallout between client and um, lawyer, and the lawyer provided a whole stack of information to the tax office. Wasn't a, a, an informer, wasn't any of those things. And the question was, was that tax office entitled to rely upon the information provided in those circumstances to pursue the client slash taxpayer? And the High Court says, yes. So how do... And I'm quite sure... I mean, there, there much are better legal... there are well, there are, there are extraordinary similarities. The answer is, how do we respect the degree of confidentiality that's expected to exist between solicitor and client? I mean, it may well be that the it wasn't facilitated or assisted by the authorities. So, but it but it would have been really handy if the High Court had referred to that case when it handed down its decision last week. <laughs> but it didn't, and this no. one is going to go for a long time. Well, can I, can I ask you though that as a lawyer? Where do you see the greatest wrong? Do you see the the actions of a lawyer vis-a-vis -vis their clients versus the uh, preparedness to accept and use the information on the behalf of the authorities? Um, I, I see that a lawyer has an obligation to respect the confidences given by the client. And I see that... Um, uh, in the administration of justice, everybody has a role to play. And the role works because we respect the integrity and effectiveness of everybody in the in the system, if you like, from the judge to the prosecutor. And it was the prosecutor in this case who came along and said, I've now been advised that the information that you obtained was tainted by the use of an informer who was a lawyer. In those And we have a system, not like the American system, we have a system whereby we give the defence all of the information that we've collected, whether we propose to use it or not, and then the court, then the defence, then makes a series of decisions about what it does, including how it conducts its defence. And so the, the prosecutor said there was a whole stack of information I should have had. It wasn't given to me. Uh, sorry, I got the information, but I wasn't told of the circumstances in which it came. I think it could be, it could have affected the prosecution. So I'm now writing to you and telling you this. And lawyer X and the police said, oops, don't. So so the, where, where it came down to is, is the... Uh, sorry, then the police have the ob obligation to collect the information. And as a general rule, they have extraordinary resources available to them. The budget of the police force is huge. I understand it's spread fairly thin, but it's a lot more than you and I would have in order to defend ourselves mm. against any charges. So we all have these roles to play and we appoint either the, the defendant appoints their own lawyer or has one appointed to them. What's the purpose of having a lawyer who's effectively facilitating the prosecution? It seems to me there's, you're better off without one if the one you've got... Is working against you. Is working against you. 
So there's the sister. That, but, and, and, what and, it, and then you also have to raise the question of even if the lawyer chooses to work against you, whether that information is actively used by authorities is another question. Well, we've now got two cases, one which says we've got the tax case from 10 mm. years ago, says you can. which says in, the, in those circumstances you can, and then another one which says in these circumstances you can't. Mm. And, and reading the articles in the Herald Sun, there are layers and layers and layers of what kind of information was provided as an informer, what kind of information was provided other than an informer, what do we do in those circumstances? It's going to so, make a great book one day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, read the judgments. They're interesting. Yes, yes. All however many hundreds of pages. No, no, the, the yeah. Supreme Court, the High Court one is 12, 14 pages, which for a High Court judgment is... Very succinct. Oh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. But nothing. it was all of the judges, so it wasn't a, you know, it was a... Every single one of the judge was, judges was a party to the case, mm-hmm. and the case and the judgments because every judge is entitled to deliver his or her own judgment, and they might come to different conclusions. These ones they were all on the same uh, on the same principle. They a joint judgment, seven judges becoming depends on the on the I think on the strength of the chief justice on this, the one we have at the moment. Most of the judgments are uh, unanimous. Oh, well, it's a fascinating story, mm. and it's one that will continue to make the front pages of, uh, I imagine, many a media outlet. Dan in Broadmeadows. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, I have a very quick question. I'm looking at div- uh, subdividing my land. Yes. Uh, I need to run Holt Pit, and uh, I originally applied through Gemini, who gave me approval. Unfortunately, that lapsed and I've just reapplied. But now they've told me that, the, uh, in their opinion, doesn't meet the regulations in that I need to run both properties uh, from the, um, the same pit. Uh, the re- reason being because we have shared common property, uh, i.e. I- the, the driveway. Now, facing the road... From the so road you're going to have an owner's corporate... You're going to have a subdivision with an owner's corporation, are you? Uh, no. No, I'm looking at subdividing the uh block yes. on the right-hand side. Uh, I'm not actually building them, so it's not three. Uh, it's just going to be a common So where's driveway. the common property? Uh, the common uh, driveway, common driveway. Yes, okay, so it is an owner's corporation. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, now, they're saying because uh, the power line crosses over, you have to uh, have a, a common pit for both properties. However... Facing the road, uh, from the road facing our property, the subdivision is going to be on the right. I live in a ex-commission house built back in the 60s with a duplex. Yes. The power to my house actually runs to number nine, which is the house on my left, and from there it runs Dan, Dan, uh, when... So I'll make it easier for you. The it, What's happened is is that as for the subdivision to proceed, the power line that will feed in the house in what's going to be the new house, will cross Dan's property. That creates a problem with the electricity supplier and that's because the rules have changed. If you look in lots of old suburbs, you'll find that there's a power line that serves your neighbour that crosses your property. Well, that happens quite often. They don't like it to happen. They really want it to be directly from a pole to your property without crossing someone else's. And so it's a change in regulation. You, I mean, it may be that you can take the matter to VCAT and get a different answer. But I, you know, I, I would have a look at the Gemini website and see what their rules are. They're a referral authority on a subdivision, and as a referral authority, they can say, we'll agree if. And that's the if, and there may well have been a change in regulation between your first application and your second one. Dan, I'm going to leave it there because your, uh, your line quality is not very good. Uh, Jenny in central Victoria. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hello, um, Ali and David. Um Yes, I have a problem with uh, um, some money owed to me by my son. Yes. Um, it's a bit of a complicated story, but to begin, um, he had a partner who was in a house with him who owed the money, so I, she transferred her share of the house over to me and I paid the debt. Um, then I transferred the title back to him when I was turning 60 because of my pension, etc. Yes. And the, the solicitor was to put a caveat on the title... Um, to protect me, but he didn't do that. Um, and now um, I have reason to believe that my son won't honour that that money that's owed to me. This, and, um, yeah, I you've, um, I'm going to say this very gently, Jenny, yeah. but it would strike me that you, 
you you might have Centrelink problems. Yes, I, I'm aware of that. No, so I, I don't have I don't have any. Um, I mean, I don't, I've got to go and see them because I've just realised that as well. I so, so Jenny, as I see it, it works. What well, works this way is that you bought out your son's partner. Yes. as part of well, some kind of breakdown of marriage or property settlement. Yeah. So you provided the funds to that to happen. You bought half the property. You then transferred it to him before you were 60. Yes. Now, the transfer, did you sell it to him? Was it natural love and no, affection? I gave it to him. It was... Well, it, it wasn't actually a buyout because it was, it was just some of the money's owed on the loan. So, but I guess it looked... Yeah, like you that. extinguished the debt. Yeah. Yeah, so you gave him money to do, or her money to do a particular yeah. thing. Now, what then happens is that you say, well, I'm going to get my pension at 65, so before I turn 60, I will dispose of my interest in the property to my son. Yeah. Now, uh, at that point, if you give it to your son, you have no claim because it's a present. Yeah. The nature of a present is it doesn't come back and doesn't come with a corresponding obligation. So... If you say there's to be a caveat, a caveat to be lodged... Well, that was advised by... Yeah, no, I understand that, but the caveat has to be... The right to lodge a caveat exists under something. So it, if there was a loan agreement, so I'll lend you $100,000, uh, or you still owe me 100 or whatever it is, then that would need to be in a formal agreement. If there's an agreement which allows you to lodge a caveat then, and he still owns the property, you can still lodge the caveat. Uh, but my difficulty is, is that from a Centrelink point of view... It's, it wouldn't be enough that would affect my pension. OK, then, then the money. answer is in your Centrelink documents you need to say that it's still a debt owed by your son. Yes. And how long ago was it? Um, 2007, so it's out, time of, it's out of the um, statute of limitations. Well, that depends on what the agreement says. Right? Now, you know, it, it, it's not related... The, your obligation under the Limitations Act... Is uh, relates to when it's due to be repaid, not when, when it's advanced. So, and has the house been sold? Well, it could be soon. Well, then lodge the caveat now and have some fun. <laughs> All right, Jenny. Thank you. Because it, it will force him to address the issue. Mm, I hope that that helps you, Jenny. Uh, Annie in Ballarat. Good morning. Oh, sorry, I've just lost. No, I haven't. There you are, Annie. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. It's nice to have you back. Thank you. Um, hi, David. Hello. Um, look, I've got a little problem with our retirement village. Um, I left a deposit, a very small one, um, on a on a unit there, and um, and then I sort of changed my mind. And uh, yep. you're allowed to change your mind, of course, but um, uh, it's a small amount. But they've taken half of it, saying that that's the fees for drawing up the contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now I asked them for a copy of the contract. Uh, probably three weeks after I signed up, and I, I was told by the, the person that uh, sort of runs the place that um, I would uh, get it in two to three weeks. Now, all the places are the same. There's hardly any difference on a contract, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do. But I just don't think they had the right to take half of it when I've never seen the contract, could not take it to my lawyer to have a look at. I, I think, Annie, the question where I would start... Mm. is show me the document that gives you the right to take the money. Right, I and, thought that... And so, uh, I mean, I can understand a situation, because I've seen it, is that you you are asked to pay for the preparation of the document. Right. And if yeah. you don't uh, proceed with the... trans, If you proceed with the transaction, then you don't pay, but if you don't proceed with the transaction, then you pay something. So right. ask for a copy of the document that created the obligation to pay. Okay, All right, and if they can't give it to you, then ask for the balance of the money back. Okay, then that's fantastic. All right. <laughs> well, I wish you both happy Christmas. Thank, Thank you, Annie. You. Same to you, Annie. I hope you have a good one. Uh, Dave, you're on the Hawkesbury. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Dave. Does this mean you're from Victoria and you're currently cruising? Is that you? Yeah? Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, All right, we should give up like, on you now. Um, yes. We're jealous. Um, a, a friend of mine, she um, is going through a divorce with a partner. And she, um, they've got children involved, and it's it's pretty ugly at the moment. But um, she had um, one of the children come home with their electronic device, which the other partner has successfully connected all of their photos, emails, and everything to. Um, she was presented with an open email from one of the children um, to 
the partner's lawyer, which said um, along the terms of, I don't care how much it costs, I came into this relationship with nothing, I want to leave, I don't care if I leave with nothing, and I'll be damned if I let him leave with anything. Um, wow. I'm just interested to know, under these circumstances, if it goes to court, can his lawyer potentially, her lawyer, sorry, potentially um, bring up that letter, which was opened, and for him to see? In well, the, uh, the answer uh, is yes, you can, Dave, uh, but you'd bring it up on the question of costs. Uh, the the problem is going to be is that ninety five percent ninety eight percent of family court cases settle. Okay. And as part of the settlement, this disappears. Sure. All right. Now it's it's a um, it's an indication if the matter was to go to trial, you it to me would be an indication. Although it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, why would not the communication between the ex partner and her lawyer be privileged? All right, well, now, yeah. uh, so there's a question as to the circumstances in which it was obtained. Um, you know, it was there, I read it, bad luck. If you don't close down your email account, that's not my problem. Yes. Okay, that's going to be the issue, always one of privilege. But if you resolve the matter, then the resolution is going to be either run on the argument that I'm going to tell the court that you're dishonest and, dis and immoral in your pro approach to the process, or it'll settle. Yep. Um, and if at yeah, the end no. of the day, uh, you know, yes, it's a factor that the court would take into account. Dave, thank you. I hope that uh, that helps. Uh, Maria, in Keylor, you um, want to talk about Lawyer X. Yes. Hello, Maria. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, back in the early 2000s, I think 2004, 2005, yes. possibly around the time this was going on with lawyer X mm -hmm. or a little earlier yep. there was another um, defence lawyer uh, in Melbourne who was found uh, guilty of or found in contempt of court for refusing to answer questions where she felt giving an answer would threaten her life Yes. and um, subsequently I think she had to or the lawyer had to fight for their practicing certificate yeah are you a fit and proper person to be carrying on legal practice in the state of victoria because there was a conviction for contempt, contempt. Of for contempt yes now um with that um the lawyer maria have was, you got a question for david because yeah so how does that um lie uh, you know uh, how do you marry that with the very strong criticism of lawyer x um with um, uh, with the expectation that under no circumstances should a lawyer divulge information, uh, etc. It just seems that there. I, there's, uh, there, Maria, I I don't remember. I do. My memory of the other matter is vague, not precise. But to me, there's a difference between information that you have which is not covered by solicitor-client privilege and information that you have which is covered by solicitor-client privilege. I see. Dave, if I was your lawyer, you're entitled to expect that whatever you tell me I won't share with someone else. Yes. All right. Now, uh, on the other hand, if I was walking down the street and saw that you were involved in a car accident, the f I may give evidence in relation to the car accident which wouldn't in any way breach privilege. I see. All right. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Rebecca in Geelong. Hi, Rebecca. Oh, hi. Thanks for your program. Um, it's always interesting, even if I um, even if I've got you know nothing about what you're talking about. It's still interesting, <laughs> and I've, I'm really glad I've got something to ask you today. Yes. Um, I'm interested in upcycling, and I'm wondering how Sorry. it goes. Sorry. Uh, what is upcycling? Oh, okay. So that's using um, products that have, uh, you know, say like a um, a filing cabinet and yes. making it into something else. Yes. Like, for example, you might put sort of a, a, a slab of wood on top and make it into a, a portable chopping block or something like that. Value adding. 
Okay, mm. yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I was sort of wondering if uh, one object's being sold as one thing and then you do something to it and sell it as another, does that sort of matter? Does it, will anybody get upset about that? Uh, it depends upon what you're doing. So if you were to take a Rolls-Royce grill and put it on something else and pretend it's a Rolls-Royce, <laughs> uh, oh, then because there was somebody put in, Cal- in Florida put a Rolls-Royce grill on a Volkswagen. What, and tried to pass it off as a no, Rolls-Royce? No, didn't try to pass it off as anything, but, but the argument was, and, and at this stage it's a design issue rather than a copyright issue. Uh, Rolls-Royce complained vehemently and was told, just go away. You know? No one is ever going to believe that this is a, um, uh, you know, a Rolls-Royce with a tiny little engine at the back. So again, Rebecca, the issue is not, um, it's not that simple. It really depends upon what you do with it. So okay. if you were to in some way try and represent that the product was had the imprimatur of the organization which had it. So you know you've got a um, you know you've got a brown belt filing cabinet and you put a lump of wood on the top, no one's ever going to believe that it's a um, a, a brown built chopping block. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, okay. Um Yes, I guess no, but nobody would probably be upset about that. I mean, I'm sort of, you know, thinking like a, a very well-known label, perhaps um, a vase. I make that into a lamp, st- a lampshade stand. No, the expectation is is that you so you take a Lalik vase, and you you go and turn it into a a lamp. Then there's no one going to have any suggestion. You're not you're not suggesting. I don't think that it's a no. Lalik original. Um, yeah, Lampstand. You, no, you quite obviously turned it from one thing to another thing. Yes. Thank you for your call, Rebecca. Uh, Arbib, uh, where are you? You're in Carlton. Hi, Arbib. Arbib. Hi. Hello. Um, hi, David. Um, my question is regarding a traffic accident that I had a few years ago. Um, what I really want to know is, you know, whether it's worth going to the court or taking the person to the court because they reversed into my car. They admitted that they were at fault by a text message to me. Yes. Uh, but they are actually refusing to pay up. How much are so we talking about, Abib? It's not much, about 1500 bucks. And do you have insurance? I only had third-party insurance. Okay. That was the problem, yeah. Look, I, I suppose I always worry that at $1,500, the chances of you getting too much back are limited. Yeah. If you hire a lawyer... You might try and do it yourself. Magistrates, court matter. Uh, but the, going to court's only half the problem. You then You've have then got to the make monies. sure that they've got the money that they can ultimately pay. Yeah, it was a tradie. And, uh, yeah, the way... The, yeah, I, I don't really know, to be honest, because I've, I've never really had any experience. Of course, well, there's, there's no reason why you couldn't. There is a process for issuing proceedings in the magistrate's court in respect of motor vehicle damage. Yes. Can I suggest that you have, at the, have a look at the online version of the law handbook yep. and see if there's something there that can assist you? Yeah, I think I did have a look, yeah. Okay. okay. The, the only, so uh, the only thing is, you know, obviously there would be out of, I would be more out of pocket and then... Well, you certainly would be in the, well, in the short yeah. term. Yeah. Uh, but, and let's say it costs you another $1,500 to get a judgment... Yep. The judgment would be two to two and a half thousand dollars, so you're out of pocket anyway. Yeah. And I don't know whether or not the tradie's got some resources from which you might be paid. Mm, you could end up in a worse position than you are right now. Uh, Daryl in Borwin. Good morning, Daryl. Good morning. How are you going? Good. Thanks for my call. I just had a query on an insurance matter. Um, I've got a uh, worth, whether it's worthwhile pursuing. Um, I've, we came home from holidays to find our house. Internally flooded. Yes. We've had to get out. My wife's landed in hospital since the middle of November. What, why? Sorry, how does the hospital trip relate to the flood? Sorry. Um, the day after the, we had to move out of our house. Yes. And I got a call the next night from one of the contractors drawing out the house to come back and relocate some equipment. Yep. Coming back, I had a minor bit motor vehicle accident. Yes. The first one in 37 years where I had to lodge a claim. Yep. But I asked the insurance company for compassion um, in terms of an excess for the house and building. It's with the same insurer. Yep. Who I won't name. Um, so they said no. 
So I escalated it, and they came back to me yesterday and said, gone all the way up to the executives, we understand, um, et cetera, et cetera, but no, we won't give you any compassion. But along the way, they said if I was poor and had no money, they'd give me um, an extra asha, um, leave it, waiver. Yes. So I'm just worth wondering whether it's worthwhile pursuing it all in terms of escalating it to the... Well, well in a sense, Darrell, you have... Uh, so you've made a claim on the insurance company. The insurance company says we'll process your claim, but there's an excess that you need to pay. Yep. Uh, mo- most insurance companies at that point, normally, um, if they're writing you a check, they'll write you a check for the net amount, rather than ask you for a check for ask you for five hundred dollars. So they can write you a check for ten thousand. They'll write you a check for nine yep. and a half. Yep. Uh, how much is the excess? It's six fifty, I suppose. It's not a lot of money, really. Um, but they kept, they're doing it. There's about a quarter of a million dollars of damage to our house. And one yes. of the people on the way said, well, we've gone back on your claims history um, and we're going to cost us more to repair your house than we'll ever get from you in lifetime premiums. And even though you've never had a claim on your policy, yes. your wife had three claims, and the value of them is this. The guy said he took four hours working it out all out to, yes. to work out whether they should give any a waiver or not, which seemed a waste of time. Um, I, I, the, the problem I've got, Daryl, is you're really saying to the insurance company, I want you to give me a present. Well... Right? And, and they've come along and said, we've got a contract with you, Daryl, that we'll, we'll honour. Yeah. Uh, that's and, that's... and that's the end of it from their point of view. Yeah, they've honoured both contracts. I suppose, from my point of view, the nexus between the motor vehicle accident and responding to their subcontractors on trying to mitigate their loss on the building claim. So the building people are saying it's not our problem, it's motor vehicle, and the motor vehicle people are saying, well, it's not our fault. You've got a house claim, um, and the two parts of the same company won't talk to each other. Well, even if they did talk to each other, uh, you've got two insurance contracts under which it would appear from what you're saying that they've honoured their responsibilities, and you've come along and said, I want my claim plus $650 because you've already got a claim current with me, or because what I've done has reduced your liability. Will I... You know, I think whatever you've done to reduce the liability will get you back into your house earlier than it otherwise might. And there's nowhere you can go that forces the insurance company to make you a present of $650. Mm. So I'm sorry, Daryl, I... I, I would, Not a uh, Christmas present for no. you, by the sound of it, Daryl. Daryl, thank you. Um, look, we are out of time, but David, I just have a really, really quick question. If you buy a house and you pay a deposit on a house, should you then insure it prior to settlement? Oh, this is my story from 2010. Oh, is it? This is now my story from 2018. But you better be quick because we're going to be in trouble. Okay. Um, I bought a house. Uh, I bought it from a mortgagee in possession between the time of final inspection and uh, the settlement. The property suffered $180,000 worth of damage uh, that was caused by people that we've not been able to locate. And I, uh, the, the, the general proposition is that the purchaser, the vendor has the obligation to deliver the property to you in the condition it was when you signed the contract, fair wear and tear accepted. In my case, that clearly wasn't met. However, uh, imagine, if you will, that you're buying a property from someone where the mortgagee takes all the money. So that you've got a broke vendor, mm-hmm. the, the mortgagee takes all of the money and so the it was okay inspection it is. and you've settled... And you go and have a look at the house the afternoon after you've settled. What's to say the vendor's got any money from which you can satisfy your claim? So in my so particular case, yourself. I come along, as it's unusual, but it's not illegal. And I say it's for, I mean, I had, I was my insurance company was fantastic in the circumstances. Um, they paid, but uh, if I'd not had insurance, there was no comeback. No, interesting, because you wouldn't expect it, would you? But David Whiting, thank you. Nice thank to you, see Ellen. you. Um, and, uh, well, have a lovely Christmas. I and plan to. Lovely holiday season. Thanks, Lee.